Amen. Well, good morning again, church. It's really exciting to be here and share the love of God. Amen. This morning, the Lord's put it in my heart to talk about knowing God. Yes. Knowing God. The Bible tells us in John 17, verse 3, the Amplified Version, it says, And this is eternal life. It means to know, to perceive, recognize, become acquainted with, and understand. You, the only true and real God, and likewise, to know Him, Jesus, as the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, whom you have sent. Amen. 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 We thank God for Jesus, but the Bible tells us that eternal life is to recognize, to perceive, to become acquainted with God. Now, I've come to realize that a lot of people know about Jesus, or know Jesus, but they don't really know God as a father. My wife and I, we were trained with Youth of the Mission. Youth of the Mission is most likely the biggest mission organization in the world. Props to all my white armies out there. And the, the motto was to know God and to make Him known. Yeah. So that was our theology, in a sense, coming into our Christian faith as young adults. To know God. To come, to perceive, to recognize, to become acquainted with and understand this God, and to make it known. Amen. You know, in the summary, that is what life is all about. I think Ecclesiastes says, and I think in the last chapter, it says, and here's a full summary of life. To fear God and to keep His commandments. <laughs> there is something about knowing God as a Father. And we need to know that we can know God as a Father. It wasn't just Jesus who Jesus said in John 5, he says, I don't do anything except what I see my Heavenly Father doing. It wasn't only Jesus who had that ability to know God. In fact, Jesus' prayer in John 17 was this, I pray that you will be one as I and my Father are one. Amen. Yes. Jesus is praying that we would come into the same fellowship, the same intimacy that he and his Father had. In fact, that was the reason Jesus came. Mm -hmm. It says in John 15, verse 15, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. Amen. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Wow. The secrets of the kingdom are with the Father, and he can make that known through Jesus Christ. We can know God intimately like Jesus. But we can't know God as a Father except through His Son, Jesus. John 14, verse 6, we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the one who leads us to the Father. The Bible says in Romans 3, 25, says, God sent Jesus, sorry, it says, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in past times. Talk about practicing his presence. Some of us, we're born in situations where we have no choice but to practice this presence. And I was born with an incurable blood disease called hereditary serifitosis, which is a form of anemia, which is basically what they call chronic fatigue. And it's not a fatal disease, but it had a lot of similar symptoms to fatal diseases. Weakness, joint aches, lack of oxygen to the brain, immune system constantly low always getting the later. I had no choice but to practice his presence. Because the Bible says, in his presence is a fullness of joy. Amen. Amen. Yes. And there's nobody who struggles with fatigue that doesn't have depression knocking at the door. 
speaking about that during the worship, I saw the Lord healing somebody in mind. The Lord says, I'm healing somebody here who's Glory. suffering with any mental illness. Glory. And just receive that, even if it's for a family member. Yes. So I learned how to practice His presence. One day, while going through a 10 day juice fast, denying myself, learning how to stay still, because I'm an extrovert, in case you haven't realized. <laughs> I learned how to stay still. The Bible says in Isaiah, it says, learn to do good. See, we become prisoners of our personalities. And these things stop us from growing. Oh, I'm an extrovert talk. I can't really pray like you. I don't expect you to pray like me, but I do expect you to grow. <laughs> Jesus says, be perfect as I am perfect. That word perfect means complete. Yeah. Yeah. James says, perseverance must finish its work until you are mature and complete, lacking nothing. So you know what? Extrovert or not, God expects us to follow an elder and dwell in his presence. Learn how to practice his presence. See how we all need each other? Regardless of whether you're a social person or not, God expects us to listen to you, McMichaels, and get into the mission field. We need each other to encourage one another, to sharpen one another. And we must stop hiding behind our personalities as excuses. Amen. I can't do this. Oh, it's a cultural thing. No, we can do all things through Christ, Christ who strengthens us. Amen. And of course, some of you will not be able to preach the way I preach because God hasn't called you to be a pastor. But when you speak, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit will speak through you. Yes. Yes. So a quick crash course on the Trinity here because I'm talking specifically about the Father. But you see, when you begin to practice His presence, you become so intimate with the Godhead that you begin to know when God is in the room. You begin to know when the Holy Spirit is moving. You begin to know when Jesus wants to give you practical words of wisdom. So Jesus is our mediator, reconciling us to God. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. I love this, teenagers. The man, Christ Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the man. Amen. So Jesus is our mediator. We pray in the name and through the name of Jesus. Yes. His name is like the power of eternity. Jesus presents us in spiritual matters, pleading our case like a lawyer who gives advice and right counsel on legal matters. John 15 verse 16 says, So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, yes. he may give it to you. Yes. It's very important that we know that anything yeah. outside of the name of Jesus is not Christianity. Amen. Amen. It is in Him we live, yes. we move, and we find our being. Yes. The Bible says in Matthew 8.20, it says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, mm -hmm. yes. I've seen gatherings, mm -hmm. I've seen churches, mm -hmm. But what makes us Christian churches is when we gather in His name, in His character. So we must be very careful and make sure that Jesus is the center of everything we're doing because there are a lot of gods out there. There are a lot of powers out there. There are a lot of spiritual forces out there. But Jesus is the way. Amen. Amen. We feel safe with Jesus. He brings us to the Father. For those of you who are holding back with spiritual gifts, well, how do I know if, if I would speak tongues of a devil? Well, how do you know if you won't? Jesus says, I will lead you to the Father. Amen. The Father. We get to talk about the Father very soon. So the role of the Holy Spirit, John 14, verse 16. And it says, and I am the Amplified Version, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, mm -hmm. counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and stand by, mm -hmm. that he may remain with you forever. John 6, 44. For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. Yes. And on the last day, I'll raise them up. Yes. So we see... We see the, the Father is doing a lot behind the scenes. Yes. Jesus goes, but the Father sends him. It is God who so loved the world. 
Not Jesus. That's right. right. Jesus goes with the love of the Father. Hallelujah. And Jesus leads us. He's the way. And when we find it, he's the written word, the truth. And when we begin to walk in that truth, that truth brings us to the light. Yeah. God is the light. Yeah. First John 3 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us yes. that we should be called children of God. Yeah. Oh. Glory. Yeah. Christians, brothers and sisters, we should be walking around with our heads high. Glory. We are God's children. He's our Father. Yes. I'm so proud Amen. to be a pastor. I don't care about your views of pastors. I'm so proud. I started getting ready for church the day before. I asked my wife. <laughs> I love the church. He said, I was glad yes. when they said, let us go into the house yes. of God. I don't know yeah. why I'm running, but in Nigeria, they run to church. <laughs> <laughs> the things of God are awesome. Amen. Amen. So God calls us his children because he wants a relationship yes. and not a religion. Yes. Amen. Amen. Right. So the question I have for you today is, do you really feel like a child of God? Do you feel like you have a father who is watching and protecting. If so, why are you so anxious and worried about life? See, I'm talking about knowing God. The progressive, the intimate progressive relationship. It's an ever increasing revelation of yes. God. Mm-hmm. When you think you know God, the Bible says knowledge pops up. A man who thinks he knows does not know as he ought to know, but love builds up. Yes. Just when you think you've known God, he begins to reveal himself in a greater dimension. And I've been, I've been resting in the Father's arms, but over the years, for over two decades now, I've, I've come to realize that I open my mouth and I'm talking about God. So it's, cool, it's cool to go do evangelism. Jesus loves you and everything, but I'm like, I realize, man, I've come to know God as my Father. Yeah. No wonder God has given me so much peace. I want you to know this, and I give this testimony all the glory, to the glory of God. If there's anything you can emulate from your pastor, God has given me the grace to overcome worry. I don't worry. God has literally eradicated worry. In my life. Lord. My wife is here. Would you tell her? Through the storms, be it financial, be it persecution, mm-hmm. be it one person in church. Mm-hmm. This church didn't start here, it started in our living room. I preached the empty chairs. I <laughs> preach the same way I'm preaching now. <laughs> Grace. <laughs> Matthew 6 25, verse 4, verse 30. Or 25 to 30. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat and what you will drink, know about your body, what you will put on. Is it not life? Is not life more more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Young people, peer pressure, competition, don't be anxious about these things. I'd rather understand the God you serve wants to give you these things. The Nike boots I'm wearing today was my Christmas gift. And I just... Expect God to give me good things. Amen. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet, I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more <coughs> clothe you. Amen. Then he drops the mic. Oh ye <laughs> of little faith. That's right. <laughs> Tell that to the psychiatrist. <laughs> Tell that. 
to the psychologist. Yeah. <laughs> I was sharing Bible studies. I, I'm writing down these uh, different sayings or different things I'm hearing from the Christian radio. <laughs> I'm going to write a book on how, sorry to say, stupid sometimes we Christians can be. <laughs> and one of them they say is that they just found out Christian radio stations. Just, wow, they just found out. You know how they, they you know, give the drum roll, that they, they give, tell you what they're about to say, then play the music when they come back. This is after doing uh, research, paying tons of uh, billions of, of dollars, billions of dollars to do this research. They just found out that the most successful, the, the, most, uh, the most important aspect to success is being confident, even when you don't feel confident. Yes. And I'm like, and I learned that in children's children's <laughs> Sunday school class. <laughs> Isaiah 32 verse 17 says, "The fruit of righteousness is peace. Yes. The effect is quietness and confidence forever." Yeah. I'm going. I'm going to tell you about things I've heard in the radio. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you of little faith, do you believe you serve a good God? Do you believe you serve a God who yeah. wants to provide, who wants to meet, yeah. who wants to bless, who wants to protect, who wants to heal? Oh, that's a hard one. Yeah. Who wants to restore? Yeah. Who respected of how many mistakes you've made? Maybe you even neglected your spouse and lost your first marriage, but he still wants you to be in a relationship because he loves you. Yeah. Maybe you were never there for your children, but he still wants you to enjoy the blessings of being a parent. Man, Man you see, yeah. your view of God will determine how you receive from God. Come on. That's yeah. good. Now this is very important. That's good. Because 2006, Baylor University took a national survey to evaluate how people view God. They found out that only 23% of people view God as a benevolent or loving God. 32% saw God as almighty and authoritarian. 60% saw God as critical. 24% saw God as distant. And Jesus came and told them, says, I am my father one. They slapped him. How <laughs> dare you call yourself the son of God? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's almost the same thing when we come to a place and say, you know, Lord just spoke to me and look at you. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing God is our DNA. The yeah. Bible says in John, it says, My sheep hear my voice. 24% yes, yes, saw God as distant. 5% claim to be atheist. Please don't be that 5%. <laughs> so, does it matter which God concept we hold to? <coughs> Recent brain research at the University of Pennsylvania has documented that all forms of contemplative meditation were associated with positive brain changes. But the greatest improvements occurred, occurred when participants meditated specifically on a God of love. I remember we're not talking about opening yourself up to some weird channel. We're talking about Jesus leading you to the Father. Okay? Such meditation was associated with growth in the prefrontal cortex of the part, which is the part of the brain right behind the forehead where we reason, make judgments, and experience God-like love. And subsequent increased cap capacity for empathy, sympathy, compassion, and altruism. Altruism is devotion to the welfare of others. But here's the most astonishing part. Not only does other-centered love increase when we worship a God of love, but sharp thinking and memory improve as well. In other words, worshiping a God of love actually stimulates the brain to heal and grow. Knowing God can stimulate your brain. I wonder if the major problem in the mental health situation today It's from their DNA, from their ancestry, or basically from the identity. 
Dr. Carl Lamy, one of the best, great, greatest brain surgeons out there, says that the underlying problem to mental health comes from a lack of identity. Where do we get our identity? From God. Our Father. Amen. My, my kids, they're getting their identity from me until they are old enough to find their own identity. I made them. I'm speaking into their lives and showing them who they can be and yeah. what they can do. Yeah. I'm teaching them life. Yeah. I believe that when we get to know God, and remember I'm talking about a progressive, intimate relationship. Yeah. It's not a one day long. The word repent in Greek means metanoia. And it means to literally change the way you think. Yeah. In fact, if you study Deep in theology, it literally means to be brainwashed, to rewire your brain from that toxic thinking that tells you, I was born like this. Mm -hmm. You are like that because we live in a falling, falling world. Yeah. But let me tell you who you are. The Bible says, He has not given us a spirit of fear, no. but of love, yeah. power, and sound mind. Amen. That is who you are. You are fearfully and wonderfully yeah. made. Yeah. That is who you are. The old has gone and now the new has come. Right. We are now new creations in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Ambassadors for God. Yeah. Yes. In fact, the Bible says it's as though God is making his appeal through us. Right. We are pastors. We are light bearers. We are ministers. Yeah. We are Christians. Yeah. Little Christ. Yeah. Man, walk into your sphere of influence. And hold your head up high as God's child, as God's children, and release life because you can know God and know His thoughts towards you. So I want to share with you very briefly seven things we can learn about the character and nature of God. This is not an extensive list. One, God loves the whole world unconditionally, <clears throat> including non Christians. Okay. John 3.16. For God so loved the world, the atheists, the Muslims, the murderers, those who sexually abuse children. That's the God he said. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever the open invitation. Believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Now you see, he's not, a, he's not as mean as Hollywood portrays him to be. It's not. It's unconditioned. Just take time and practice his presence. Dwell in his presence. And begin to envision a God of love. Begin to see him rejoicing over you with singing. Stop seeing a distant God. Oh, if I had time to break this down. You see, sometimes due to respect and due to having 30 minutes to tell you everything about life, we can't preach enough. But God is, the Bible says, He is a present help in me. He's in the midst of me. Don't think that God is distant from that emotional trauma you're going through right, yeah. that you're not even able to open up. Yeah. Don't think that God is distant from your sexual desires. <laughs> well, come on. Now. Don't think that God is distant from your desire for material things. Right. Don't think that God is distant from your appetites. He created you. And it's only when you begin to go to him and talk to him, he begins to work in you, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. He begins to teach you. He begins to give you self-control because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, yeah. patience, kindness, Glory. faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Christians, we need to remember that's also one of the fruits of the Spirit. Self-control. Yeah. 
God has rewritten my script. He's rewired my brain. I took my mess to him. I took my addiction to him. I took my perversion to him. I took my mess to him. And he turned it out to a beautiful yeah. message. He's turned me from a, a willful sinner to a light bearer. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that we have we have been delivered from darkness yeah. into His yes. wonderful light. Yes. Man, I don't know about you, but I am sprayed with the aroma of Christ. I smell and I look like Jesus. The God you see Hallelujah. will determine the God you will manifest. I see a God who yes. loves me. I see a God who can't wait for Phil to get up. Because he neither sleeps nor slumbers. Hey, Emma, fills up, fills up. <laughs> he's rejoicing, he's dancing. He said, Just what he's going to do today. Man, his wife hasn't even gotten up. He's already ministered to like five people on WhatsApp. Hey, just watch how he's going to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and meet that person's oh. need. He's going to be himself, not by his power, not by his strength, but he's going to be used by yeah. God. <laughs> We must get to a place where yeah. our very existence, our very identity does not come from our spouse, does not come from our heavenly father, from our earthly father, but comes from our heavenly yeah. father. Some of us are still looking and waiting for so much validation from our, from our parents. And we spent years stuck in that valley saying, you don't realize my dad was never there for me. You don't realize I was sexually abused and this and that. I'm sorry that those bad things happened to you. Yeah. But when the Father, when the Father who created you, like you spoke to, uh, this earlier on, now, one second in his presence, he can fix that emotional mess. Amen. Amen. Woo. Glory. That's the God's <laughs> Second, you can never have complete identity outside of God because our spirit cries out, Our Father, Father. I guess I'm going to head of myself. <laughs> Romans 8 15. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. This is why the Bible tells us that we can approach Him with boldness. Yes. This is why in Matthew 7, when it says, ask, in that particular verse, that word ask in Greek means to demand. It's depicting a boldness, a confidence in God. Yeah. We're not slaves, we're not aliens. We are children of God. Yeah. And our spirit says, instead you received God's spirit. Yeah. When, you, when he adopted you as his own children, now we call him Abba, Father. Yes. Yeah. Have you ever felt lonely? Have you ever felt rejected? Have you ever felt persecuted? Guess what? You have a father that you can call on in those times. David says, even though my mother, my father can say to me, my God shall never leave. That's right. Our identity comes from God. Our spirit cries out, Abba, Father. Yeah. Number three, the Father promises to give you the Holy Spirit. He promises to give you a comforter. He promises to give you a helper. One of my most spectacular, sacred times came in one of my most lonely times. You know, just because we're, we feel lonely doesn't necessarily mean we're alone. I know. And each and every one of us has gone through that time where they kind of felt lonely. And again, Psalm 68, 5 to 6 says, A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. We have no excuse to be lonely. We serve a God who understands and wants to set you up in a family. Yeah. Isaac felt lonely, and God blessed him with Rebecca. The Bible says it was to comfort him from the loss of his mother. Are you going through a time of grieving? Do you feel lonely? You don't have to be alone. If you open your heart, if you dwell in his presence, mm -hmm. if you practice his presence, if you know the secret place, just maybe the Father will reveal himself to you. Yeah. Lord. John 14, 15 to 17. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, 
and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The world cannot receive it because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in So remember, the Holy Spirit empowers us. But who sends the Holy Spirit? The Father. Number four, he knows everything before you ask. Yes. Man, if you understand this, you can save on all those counseling sessions. I'm not against going for counseling, whether it's being professional, whether it's within the church. But I myself, I've got a lot of counseling. In fact, I remember that the last day I stopped going to my mom for counseling. It was something heavy on my heart. And I really, it was literally a way to my door. And I was about to knock. Holy Spirit just popped up. I just stood there and the Lord began to counsel me. <laughs> that was it. I began to learn to trust more in the counsel of God. Glory. Many questions need no answers. But when the heart becomes one with the Spirit, there becomes an illumination of the mind. An understanding, revelation now becomes a, a, a state of the heart, not an achievement of the mind. Illumination. Jesus said it in John. He said, anyone who wants to know that Father's will will have the needed revelation, the illumination to know if these words are from me or from God. Mm-hmm. If we can only learn to stand still mm-hmm. and know He is God. Mm-hmm. The Father, if you hang out in His presence long enough, if you talk, if you abide in His Word, who is Jesus, long enough, that Word will lead you to the Father. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that Father has so much love available for you to heal you of those past traumas, to heal you of that emptiness, to, to, to meet that deep emotional need. Yeah. And even before you ask, He knows. Yeah. In fact, so many times we think we're praying. But true prayer is not necessarily the way you think you're at with God, or where people say you're at with God, but where God says you're at with Him. Some of us say, I'm praying, and you are talking to God about your finances. God says, No. You need to be talking to me about your marital issues, because I know that that's the root of everything. Yeah. You're telling God, If I could just only make more, my more money, my spouse will love me more. If I could just get more money, then I'll feel more secure in myself, and then the marriage will begin to work out. And God says, no, no. There are things from your past you haven't yet dealt with. Oh, come on, church. Oh, oh my gosh, yes. I remember when my wife and I were counseling somebody. First session, we're about to start, I just got a word about something, about when her dad left her. And she just began to share her own testimony of the scars of be the child of the divorced parents. As the Lord just began to use it, she just began to weep. It was that the root. And she took, she, the Holy Spirit took her back to when her dad left her. And she found out that even though we were counseling her because she was in a relationship with a narcissistic person, that narcissistic person wasn't really the issue. The issue was the emptiness yeah. and the lack of a father in her life. Yeah. You see, because when you're filled with this love, how great is the love that is lavished upon you? Yeah. Love covers a multitude of sins. As the healing took place, mm-hmm. automatically the marriage just began to blossom. Glory, yeah. True prayer is not necessarily where you think you're at with God, or where people say you're at with God, mm-hmm. but where God says you're at with God. A father, a counselor. Number five, he gives good gifts. Oh, church, amen. I know that in Nigeria we call them petty rascals. Forgive me. I know that the church has become something and they are cruising on the jets and they are taking things to the extreme. But that does not change the character of God. 
God's plans for you are plans for good. Yes, that's right. Poverty Hallelujah. does not give God joy. That's right. Lack does not give God joy. Not having enough to pay your bills does not give God joy. He gives good gifts. He gives you more than enough. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians yes. 9 and 8. Yeah. He's all sufficient. Yeah. Matthew 6 8 says, Don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need. You know, sorry, I went, that's the fourth example. The fifth. Matthew 7 11. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? Amen. Amen. Let me tell you why a lot of people don't shy away from talking about this. It's because they have a form of righteousness that they don't know is a bit of self-righteousness that they are more concerned about how people feel about them yeah. so they don't want to they don't want to preach that god is the gift god so that they people will not misunderstand them and think that they were preaching they the claims you see but my message here is not about oh i hope they don't misunderstand me that's important but what's important is that you know the truth that the truth sets you free right. because maybe yeah. you got your 401k taken yeah. care of maybe you have enough in your savings but i know i need to know a god who gives good gifts i know i need to know jehovah Jireh as my provider and maybe somebody here today needs to know that god gives good gifts amen yeah, yeah. i've grown I'm grown, you know, but there was a time that I didn't want to do the mission thing again except God gave me a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was being a bit immature. Yes, I was being a bit selfish. But the Bible says when you're tempted beyond your strength, He will provide a way of escape. <laughs> and He began to use that motorcycle as a reward. He began to have this conversation with me. He says, My son, why don't you walk before me a blameless and faithful life? And I'll always bless you with these things. Yeah. Yeah. Give you scripture. Yeah. Hebrews, 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 uh, <laughs> Hebrews 10, yeah. 35 down to 36, talking yeah. about, says, let us not throw away our confidence. Yeah. But we know that when we persevere to do the will of God, He will reward us. Yeah. 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 Don't tell God, you see, in our self-righteousness, we say, oh God, I don't want this. Oh, come on. We say, oh, <laughs> don't limit God. Right. Don't tell God what He wants to do for you. Yes. Right. Because it might not just even be for you. It might be about the testimony that will bless the young people. It might be about the testimony that will bless your neighbors. Yes. Because we overcome by the blood of the Lamb or by the word of our testimony. Yes. If somebody comes and gives me a prophetic word, I see God giving you a mega church, I will say amen. I don't care about your opinion. I don't care what you feel about me. All I know is that it is disobedience not to receive the gift of God. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Wow. That's right. yeah. Humility is not taking or adding from God's word. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If Billy Graham was not as great as he was, some of us and our forefathers would not be here today. Yeah. If some of those TV evangelists and all the, and all, and the, and the millions he's blessed them with to put the message out on TV, some of us would not be in church today. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you, I've seen good, noble Christians who mean well that need a shift in this area. When your heart is in the right place, yeah. God will bless you. Yeah. Yeah. I just spoke the harvest. Jesus. Watch God. No, no, Watch Jesus. God. Hallelujah. Watch God. Yes. And you begin to know that Phil didn't start last year. <laughs> Phil started with this covenant, believing God for a youth center 20 something years ago, and he's been waiting faithfully. Oh. And right now, you give me a million dollars. I know what I'm going to do with it till the penny. Glory, glory. It, it, if nothing, oh, a million dollars, no, but finally, thank you, Lord, go, church, this, that, things in place. I already have the vision, I'm waiting on God. Amen. 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 Yes. If you're not thinking big, I am. Amen. I need money. Jesus. The Bible says money answers all things. Yes. Debunk that theology that tells you money is for the world and take back what the devil has stolen because he says it to God. Yes. 
We shall overcome by the power of our wealth. Oh God, raise up a businessman in this church who will just sign one check and, and, and buy this church so that we can lead multitudes. Do you know what's happening in this church? Do you know in this very spot I'm standing, somebody was there and I pointed to that person under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and I called that person out and I spoke. Yeah. And that person was one day away from committing suicide. Wow. If you don't know what to do with money, I do. If you don't have a vision, I do. If you're not going somewhere, I'm going. Man, God bless. God bless. God, bring me the harvest. Bring me the harvest. Let's lift up your name. Number six. His love is beyond human understanding. Yes. Yeah. Ephesians 3, 18 to 19 says, And you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep His love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully by God. If God is speaking to you about going back to Bible school, it's so that you can understand the love of God more. Right. It's not about theology. <laughs> I went back to Bible school, did the school of biblical studies all over again. It made me a better spouse, a better parent, and a better leader. I encountered God through the scriptures. It's not a knowledge thing. It's not about Greek and Hebrew. It's about an experience that makes you content, that makes you secure in the Father's love, that makes you contagious and influential, that when you show up and you speak, also Paul says, I've not come to you in eloquent speech, but in the demonstration of the Spirit's power, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but it's about power. I have spoken words with that people who have mentally challenged have immediately received healing. In this church, we laid hands over somebody who had been struggling with alcohol for, she was in her 60s. Instantly, she got delivered. No symptoms, no um, withdrawals. Things are happening before your very eyes in this church. Amen. Hallelujah. Bible school. I went back and it refired me. I realized that God has given me everything I need pertaining to the life I've gotten. So sorry, I, re I remembered. Because that's the problem. We forget. I forgot that it was Him calling me, not me calling myself. So he said, go. I said, Lord, I'm going. Go to Walla Walla. Yes, Lord. You just say, jump. And I'll say, how high? Because I know he has gone ahead of me. Wow. It's also, his love is so, it's so beyond human understanding that it goes to save the 99. We know that story. Yeah. Maybe today you feel like that lost sheep. Leave the 99 so it goes to say that last one shit. You see, sometimes we're praying, I'm praying, and if you spirit feel prayer, sometimes you're praying and you think God is praying for homosexuals, God is praying for the murderers, God is talking about prison ministry, God is talking about those who are in bondage. That's the heart of the Father. And lastly, He releases grace to fight the devil. This is where a lot of Christians are missing. James 4 verse 6, the Passion Translation says, But he continues to pour out more and more grace upon us. For it says, God resists you when you are proud, but continually pours out grace when you are humble. When we build a relationship with God, who you know as we have. Humility is the only way to know God. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and if you seize it, he shall lift you up. <clears throat> when we humble ourselves, God empowers us with all grace. And then, <coughs> some of us are fighting battles, 
some of us are still struggling with addictions, some of us are still letting these sins and, and ways be set us simply because we have not built an intimate, progressive relationship with God the Father. When you meet God the Father, you will bow down in worship. And when you bow down in worship, the Bible says He gives grace more and more so that you can resist the devil. Amen. That's the grace of God working in us in Philippians 2.13. It says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Wow! God is giving you the power. God is giving somebody the power to do it. Bible says in Titus 2.11, it says that the grace of God has been revealed to all men, and this grace teaches us how to say no to ungodliness. Church, rise up. We have the power to say no. We have the power to rise above. We are overcomers. We can say no to porn, no to adultery, no to addiction, no to, to the love of money, no to peer pressure, no to the influence of the world. There's a power working in you. Next week we're going to be talking about Resurrection Sunday. Do you realize that Resurrection Sunday, as much as Jesus rose from the dead, it was God who raised him from the dead. Right. Romans, Romans 8, 11, it says, and if that same spirit that be in you, that was in Christ Jesus, yeah. that's that right. same spirit will be in you on the body. How God raised him from the dead. Thank you.